Chapter 6 Mutated Misfits It was a hot, muggy, and all-around miserable day to be marching through the Feywood in plate armor. Alistair found himself again grateful for the blood-red headband that he always had tied around his forehead. It did wonders for soaking up the gallons of sweat that poured from his brow. He had briefly considered shaving bald to help with the particularly brutal heat of this year's summer, but Alistair simply couldn't bring himself to cut off his ear-length blonde locks. Besides, if he really did shave it off, by the time winter came, his scalp would surely freeze. Who knew? Maybe hair would never grow there again if he allowed that to happen. No. Alistair would rather keep his scalp the way the pillar gods intended, nice and warm beneath a head of glorious golden hair. He then gave a small curse as he stumbled over a twig, nearly falling face first into a clump of brambles. There weren't any real trails through the Feywood, unfortunately, meaning that this journey had been a truly rough one. It didn't help that their donkey had been killed by fiends, leaving them to carry everything on their backs. Look, Ellen began with a sigh. All I'm saying is we have to hurry through here. We don't have the time to go sightseeing in these damn wilds. Alistair sighed and nodded in agreement with Elam. You think I don't know that? Alistair asked. We've been keeping on the path this whole journey. Saying sightseeing makes it sound like a grand old time. But trust me, I'm not liking this either. Knowing that a fiend could be lurking around every tree or bush didn't make the journey any more tolerable. The fiend wall truly must have fallen for so many creatures to be prowling about these woods. Thankfully, the fiends had thinned out after the first couple of days of this trek. But up until this point, the fighting had been constant, as if the forest itself had sent all of its fallen creatures to bring down any intruders that dare tread upon this fake hen cursed soil. Alistair might have put more stock in that theory had there not been evidence of Watchers fighting these beasts as well. Watchers were the keepers of the Feywood, after all. If they had intended to use fiends to ward off visitors, the Watchers wouldn't be killing them off. Mysterious as the Watchers were, though, Alistair truly doubted they'd allow fiends, of all things, to simply prowl about unopposed. Sightseeing, Alistair mocked in a high pitch, making a rude gesture to Elam as he did so. Well, I know one of us is, Elam said with yet another sigh, giving a lazy wave toward Twindill. The half-elf woman was further ahead on the path than the majority of the party, walking through the woods with such a look of wonder on her face that it made Alistair struggle to find her sudden occasional stops aggravating. It wasn't even as if she took several minutes per stop. All she did was stop and lean over a flower or place a hand atop a tree trunk. She looked almost at home. Swap the gleaming plate armor and oversized greatsword that Twindle wore with the Watcher's cloak and some daggers, and she might have looked perfectly at home. Well, maybe not even then. She was a large woman, only shorter than Alistair by a finger, and maybe just as strong as he. Her hair was spun gold, almost gleaming in the sunlight, seeping down from between the broad leaves overhead. Her human parent must have been a massive man. Or woman? Twindle did not seem to know herself, but Alistair didn't want to press the matter. He really wasn't all too curious about her lineage, and he wasn't sure if it was a sensitive topic for her. Alistair would rather avoid making anyone cry. Tears made him uncomfortable. She would sniff every flower in the Feywood and hug every Drakehurst tree if we had the time, Ella muttered under his breath. Shaking his head as Twindle spotted a particularly large tree, quickly moving up to inspect it for a second before again moving on. The crimson-skinned Ifrit, likely would have insisted on traipsing about the Feywood just as Twindle did, had there not been urgent matters pressing them forward. Tuji was right on their tail. That freak was only a few days behind them at most. Not only that, but there was also the matter of the score they had to settle with Kazan in the cursed Fiendwood. Kazan, more so than Tuji, was what forced them into passing through this forest. One couldn't hope to get to the Fiendwood without first passing through the Feywood, unless they wanted to make a round-the-world journey across every great bridge to take a route through the Blastlands. That would be about 200 times more foolish, and Tuji would certainly catch them long before they reached their destination. Alistair's brows knit together in frustration at their pursuit. It wasn't as if they wouldn't be able to defeat Tuji if they all worked together. The problem was that a few of them would certainly die in the resulting battle before Tuji could be brought down. Others had tried to take down the madman in the past, their efforts in vain as they lacked the special talents Alistair and his friends had. He couldn't even imagine attempting to battle Tuji without the aid of Foundation an ability most people lacked. He doubted that these Watchers could draw on the raw golden flame, or at least none of them could do it to Alistair's level. He dearly hoped that none of these elves would try to attack Tuji, or else they would surely be killed. What if that mad bastard tried to challenge the Watchers? The main reason he and the party fled from the mad half-orc rather than outright deny the challenge was that there would be no way for any of them to turn it down once it was issued. Not easily, anyhow. It was simply a part of their nature, Something that couldn't be simply ignored. These Watchers, though, they wouldn't be prone to such a thing. 
not unless there was one among these sneaky elves that were like Alistair and his friends. He doubted that any normal watcher would outright accept a challenge from the man either, but who was to say? After all, Alistair did not know how these watchers did things. Not many people did. He knew that they at least wouldn't attack on sight. One would have to harm the forest in some way to provoke that kind of response. Poaching was a big one. Though, Alistair had heard that if someone appeared to be on the brink of starvation, the watchers may let the poaching slide. Wasn't fair to let someone die of starvation when there were plenty of bunnies hopping about. Yet, maybe the potential rule only applied during the winter months, when the forest could not yield any sort of fruits or berries to pick. The watchers wouldn't let anyone get away with cutting down trees, though. Everyone at least knew that much. That old El Theopalu dragging his feet up ahead of Twindill would know better than anyone, of course, as he used to be a watcher himself years back. At least, that was what the geezer had claimed before they'd hired him. Alistair had never before met an elf that had borne wrinkles before having met Theopalu at the tavern in Greyshane. Despite the deeply furrowed wrinkles, however, the old elf bore no silver hairs in his long black locks. Alistair was only in his twenty-fourth year, but already he had some silver strands. That was normal, though, as Alistair himself was a human. Yet Theopalu had to be thousands of years, no, maybe even older than that, to be an elf and have wrinkles. Alistair and indeed his other companions had been wondering themselves as to just how old Theopalu must have been. Not that the old codger would spill the beans on anything pertaining to his past, of course. He wouldn't tell them anything about the Watchers, either. Not their rules or how they acted upon finding outsiders. It was positively infuriating how much Theopalu held back. What if Alistar stepped on a branch and got an arrow to the throat for snapping a piece of a tree? It would be nice to at least know what not to do. But Theopalu had refused to say a word about anything that didn't relate to what they had hired him for. It was either that or Theopalu couldn't, or more likely wouldn't, tell them anything that might tread upon Watcher's secrets. All the old elf wanted to do was guide Alistair and his friends through the Feywood. Then, finally, into the Fiendwood. The demanded price for such a dangerous undertaking? To head into a land where no man has ever returned? Kazan's lair and the origin of spiraling death? Food. That was it. No coins or jewels, nor favors or potential deals with Alistair's people. Just food. Alistair narrowed his eyes at the old elf. There was something more to this strange fake in than just being old. He just knew it. The sheer confidence that Theopalu placed in himself to be able to pass through the Fiendwood unscathed was what got him hired in the first place. That, and his apparent age. Who was to say? Theopalu could possibly be even older than the Fiendwood itself. You all right, Alistair? Kidka asked, appearing like a pale phantom at Alistair's side. You look, a uh, not all right, he finished in an unsure tone. About a head shorter than Alistair and pale as a spirit, Kidka looked to be the type to stay inside all day. Yet the pale, almost silvery skin was the result of exclusively hunting during nighttime. The dark-haired Kidka looked to be suffering worse than even Alistair was, based on the deep red tinge of sunseer on his cheeks. Thankfully, Alistair had become used to Kidka's sudden appearances long ago, else Alistair may have tried to bring his warhammer down upon the smaller man's head. I'm all right. It's just... How can we really trust the Apalu? We know nothing about him or why he agreed to do any of this. It's suspicious, Alistair said honestly, making sure to lower his tone so Theopalu didn't hear. Supposedly all he wants is food, but I don't believe that for a damn second. Kidka adjusted the red cloak he wore as his dark eyes found the elder elf. He's alright, he just eats a lot. Theopalu had proven capable of devouring with ease plates an orc warlord would have trouble downing. Yet there were plenty of other ways for our former watcher to get food. So why take such a dangerous job in the Fiendwood? He focused his attention on the old elf ahead once more, seeing the elf stop a moment to pick up a particularly large spider. Its leg span was nearly the size of the elf's head. Alistair felt a cold shudder of revulsion as he watched the Apalu's jaw unhinge to swallow the poor arachnid whole. The old elf barely stopping to chew his unfortunate morsel as he continued to move along. He, uh... Kidka began nervously as he too looked away from the elf's back. He eats a whole lot. It's just how he is. It's ridiculous is what it is, Alistair replied. Alistair replied, unable to keep some bafflement from his tone. It is not natural, he continued, pausing for emphasis. Some of the things we can do aren't exactly natural either, my friend, Elam told him with a small laugh. I feel it might be a bit much to say that her old feeble elf's appetite is strange, when we can do things only talked about in stories. Alistair turned his head to lock eyes with Elam, his icy blues meeting Elam's fiery reds. We can't let that slip, 
Alistair whispered sharply. You know what could happen to us if we're found out? It's best to avoid speaking of it entirely. Alistair finished, taking a deep breath and looking to see if the trees had ears. In this forest, who's to say they didn't? Elam then looked to the branches overhead, straining his eyes likely in an attempt to discern any watchers tailing them. Kidka cleared his throat and promptly wrapped his arms around both Alistair and Elam's necks. Before either could react, Kidka quickly began whispering, making sure to keep his eyes planted firmly ahead. Three of them overhead, five behind, don't look. Kidka rushed out in a hushed tone as he pulled Alistair and Elam's heads back down. Alistair hadn't been able to discern anything amongst the trees when he made that glance, besides Nolvi dragging her feet behind the rest of them. Not too far at the risk of being snatched away by watchers or forest creatures. The woman thankfully hadn't noticed the interaction ahead of her. But then again, that girl wouldn't have noticed if a flaming frog had jumped up her skirt. Thanks to this foolish reaction to Kidka's words, the watchers surely knew that the party was aware of their presence. Hopefully, that would not provoke them in any way. Alistair would hate to have to summon Baumiel just to fight watchers. They did not deserve to feel the angel's teeth grinding them to paste. Yeah, I love you like brothers, Kidka yelled in the most forced tone Alistair had ever heard in his life. I just like hugging you is all. You can... Uh, now you can go off my arms. The poor guy wasn't exactly the best with words, but Alistair decided to play along. Yeah, yeah, of course. Love you too. Alistair said casually as he quickly shrugged out of Kidka's grasp. Elam, however, was not as gentle. Don't touch me, you reek of pig guts and sour fruit, Elam shouted, poking Kidka in the chest and forcing the other man back a few steps. Kidka, for his part, looked innocently confused for a moment before he finally replied with, But you smell like sulfur. Like, it's bad. Like, really bad. Yeah, you do smell like butt rock. Alistar laughed forcefully, roughly patting Elam's shoulder. Now let's keep going, please, he whispered harshly through clenched teeth as he not so gently pushed Elam along. Twindale had turned back to look at them, a blonde brow raised before all three simply smiled and waved. The last thing they all wanted to do was get a talking to about Athena's tranquility, and how peace must be upheld at any cost. Sometimes that peace had to come about through a thorough beating. Thankfully, none of them had pushed Twindale to that point yet, but he could tell her deep well of patience was being strained. Not that Alastair would just allow Twindle to bend him over her knee and paddle him, of course. It was just a confrontation he'd rather avoid. He looked past her to see a break in the trees. A field? Theopolu paused a long while before passing to that breach in the trees. For what reason, Alastair didn't know. The old elf had only stopped in his tracks when it was time to let them sleep, and there was still a decent amount of daylight left. It was when he drew closer that he saw it. A giant steel... egg? egg had smashed through the grassy field, splitting the soil beneath it in half. No, this wasn't an egg. Could this have been one of the falling stars? Had one landed in the Feywood? Curiosity drew him forth, and Alistair soon found himself standing only a few paces away from the metal mass. It had shot through a few trees when it crashed, based on the fact that the trail continued on past where the star now sat. Something had dragged it out of the woods and back into the middle of this field. But what could have been strong enough to do that? Maybe the Watchers had all worked together to haul it out. Perhaps they had used one of their moving trees. Yes, that had to be it. But then, why was it still sitting here? Wouldn't they have taken it somewhere more secure to study it? A strange omen, Twindale muttered. I hope it means we're on the right path, Athena willing. She continued as Elam rounded the star. Alastair was still staring at the front of the thing. Why did the star have what almost looked to be a door? It was a strange device next to the sealed entrance, embedded into the wall, bearing nine letters atop what appeared to be miniature pressure plates. No, not letters. Those were Sihar numerical digits, all the way from one to nine. Was this some kind of security against intruders? His brain continued to work as he stared at the thing, the gears in his head whirring at full speed. Perhaps it was similar to that of a combination lock. Yes, that had to be it. One likely had to push the pressure plates in the correct order to get the egg to open. If that were the case, what was the combination? More importantly, where was the creature that knew the pattern necessary to open what seemed to be its lair? Alistair's eyes found Kidka, the man standing next to a trail of heavy boot prints set deep in the torn soil. Heavy boots certainly to leave that kind of impression, and what a boot size. The footprints were even larger than Alistair's torso, and he was not a slight man. This was clearly no star. It was something else. Something had fallen with this steel egg-shaped contraption, and it didn't seem to be home. If this thing is made out of this kind of metal, Kidka muttered, knocking on the pod, then it isn't natural, whatever it is, echoing Alistair's thoughts. 
There's a window on the side, Elam shouted. I cannot see through the black glass, but I believe that is because it is one-sided. What do you think, Baumiel? Alistar thought to his Eidolon. It is certainly not a star. The stars are not so simple as dots in the sky, Alistair, though you know that by now. The angel's voices replied, two bestial and angelic tones layering over one another as it spoke. Do you think we would be able to break inside? Alistair thought to Baumiel. Perhaps. But do you really have the time to be fooling around with this thing? Tuji closes on you as we speak. But if you insist, then we can try. I'm going to summon Baumiel. Alistair said aloud to Twindil, who licked the small scar at her lip. He knew her long enough to know that this meant she was nervous. I have the sanctioning papers, but... But if they look too closely, she whispered, then we'll have no choice about what comes next. Perhaps it would simply be best to leave it be, Alistair. Calm down now, Elam began, rounding the steel egg to come standing right next to the door. Maybe we can figure out a way inside without summoning your... friend. The Ifrit finished after a short pause. I do not think you would know the combination to that pad, and breaking the glass at the front of the thing would likely prove to be futile, lest I summon Baumiel. Alistair said, drawing closer to the otherworldly thing. Why do you think that? Nolvi asked silently, her eyes not moving a hair from the ground at her feet. This contraption, whatever it is, fell from the skies with nary a dent, Alistair explained. Elam also says that the glass at the front is not broken. Who knows? Perhaps it can't be broken by natural means, Alistair replied, rubbing his chin. Why waste your time with this thing? Leave now before the Pillarborn comes to find you deliberating, Baumiel told him, its tone bordering on commanding. It fell from the very stars themselves, but lay within could help us defeat Tuji, or even Kazan, Alistair thought back. Who knows what could lay within? Can you really tell me that this contraption would hold nothing of use? You would be thieving from whatever creature lives there. Who knows? Perhaps it is within, pondering the best way in which to slay us all should we breach its lair. Baumiel replied, his tones warning. Twindil then shook her head. It would be best to move on. We've dallied enough as it is. Twindil, please let me at least attempt. Alistair nearly pleaded, stepping closer to Twindil till they were only a pace apart. His voice turning to a whisper as continued. The papers you carry could convince a contextualizer. He continued, putting a hand on her shoulder before leading closer. It fell from the stars. It could be over the very pillars themselves. Who knows? Maybe there is something within that can... Alistair hesitated, sparing a quick glance at the trees before looking back into Twindle's eyes. Something to halt the madness. I know it's not likely, but I have to look, please. Elam and Kidka stared at the two of them, inching closer, likely in an attempt to hear the words that were being exchanged. Novi and Theopolu, though? Theopolu squatted towards the edge of the clearing, having found another large insect to devour. It was a fist-sized beetle this time and the ever-hungry elven geezer wasted no time in cramming it down his gullet. It didn't even look like Theopolu made any effort to chew. And Nolvi? Completely unresponsive to his surroundings as ever. It was hard to believe that such a petite woman could potentially kill with a look. Shrugging off his hand and looking toward the steel egg for a long while, before finally saying, Announce your attentions, let the watchers know what you're going to do, and make sure they won't take offense. They are here, I am sure of it, waiting to see what we'll do. She finished with a worried sigh. Alistair smiled and gave a small nod, stepping back and raising his hands high in the air, readying to proclaim his intentions. Watchers, he shouted, his voice echoing through the trees. Hear me, for I know you are there. I am from the Ather caravans. Like the rest of my people, I have an Eidolon. I know not what you may have heard about us, but I am sanctioned. I do not wish to offend, but I desire to know what is inside this thing. He continued, gesturing toward the seal egg. If you have any objections, speak them now to avoid conflict with us. If you say nothing, I will take that as consent to my actions. Alistair waited for a reply. The others in his group, save Theopolu and Nolvi, of course, began pensively scanning the trees. After a few moments of pure silence passed, Alistair took a deep breath and began the summoning. His forehead burned, the budding horn between the headbands seeming to strain against the cloth as he willed Baumiel to come forth. If the Watchers attacked them, Alistair would feel no guilt in retaliating. They had plenty of time to voice any complaints, and hadn't. That was on them, not Alistair. Perhaps they wanted them to crack this thing open? Did the Watchers not have the means to open the egg themselves? What if they were simply waiting for the contents to be revealed before trying to seize the goods for themselves? Alistair shook his head. He would deal with it if that came to pass. Now, time to bust this thing open before whatever lived here returned.
If you're new here, welcome aboard. Check out the description for the story, and join the Discord if you like. Consider supporting the channel and the author as well. It's a dangerous world out there, but remember to be brave and look up to seek the stars. Thank you.